What's going on everybody? Thanks for tuning back in. Today we're starting a brand new series where we're going to build a Pokemon Red Blue clone from scratch. You could call it Pokemon Green, Pokemon Godot, whatever you want. This is going to be a brand new game. This won't be a long drawn out tutorial, just some quick focused videos that get straight to the point so you can start coding fast. In each part of this series we'll tackle a specific feature from player movement to mapping to battle mechanics if we make it that far and everything in between. By the end, you should have a super basic working Pokemon game, which will teach you some of the basics of coding in Godot using C Sharp. And anything else you learn along the way is just a bonus. For a lot of us, Pokemon Red and Blue were more than just games. They were a huge part of our childhood. Pokemon Blue is the first game I personally ever owned and any sort of console, my Game Boy being my first console. And I remember being hooked, playing for hours, completely hooked on the adventure, the battles, the challenge of catching Pokemon, everything. So if you're a programmer like me, I hope this series brings out some nostalgia for you and you have fun making this game with me. Okay guys, let's jump into it. So open up Godot using your C Sharp version. Make sure that you are using the C Sharp one so you can use it. Make sure you have all of your .NET libraries installed and create a basic project. And you can see here, I've already created some folders, assets, resources, scenes, and scripts. These are just some of the most basic folders that you're gonna need inside of your project. And what we're going to do is we're going to start making a couple helper classes in this video to help our development. So inside of the scripts folder, create a new folder called core. This will just be our core libraries for the game that are used everywhere. Inside of it, you're going to create a new script, switch it to the C sharp in the language dropdown, and we're going to name this logger. I like to create a login class with whatever project I'm working in to customize my logging so I can control it. Uncheck the template so we can make it empty and then open it with your preferred editor. You can do this inside the Godot editor or in VS Code like I'm doing here. Now, before we do anything else, let's update the .NET version for this Godot project to whichever version is latest on your computer. Mine is the uh, Net 8.0. So here I'm just switching the target framework and that's all you have to do inside of your CS project file. And when you close that, VS Code or whatever IDE you are in should automatically update to using that new framework. I like to wrap my classes inside of a namespace. So we're gonna call this game and then whatever folder of the scripts is in is gonna be the next subfolder. So I'll call this game.core. And inside, I'm gonna change this logging class I have here, this logger class to a static class because I wanna access it anywhere from the game. And then I'm gonna create a couple functions. Generally, there are four log levels you would work with when creating a program or a game. Those are debug, info, warning, and error. Create a function for each, all of them returning void, all of them static. And they all take one argument, which is a params object array, and you could just name it message. This is the same input that the Godot print function takes in C Sharp. Finally, create a fifth function. And what we're gonna do is call this our log function. You're gonna pass in an extra parameter called level, that's a string. And each of the previous four functions is going to call the log function with their associated log level. So you can see here, we're gonna have like a log debug, log info, log warning, and log error, as I'm doing on the screen. That way, any changes we wanna to make to our logging class, we could just do inside this log function and ignore everything else. Now, depending how you like to construct your log message, you may just want the log level, and then that's it. I like to add a couple extra things. I like to add the date and time. I like to add where this function was called from, the stack trace. So let's create a couple of variables to help us that we're gonna fill out in our log message. First, let's grab the date time. This can be grabbed from the datetime.now function. And then inside the string, you can, you can add formatting like this to the date time object and pass in any sort of date time you like. I like to do the year, month, day, hour, minute, second. You can do milliseconds. You could just do the day. You could just do the time, whatever you want. Once you're satisfied with the timestamp, it's time to get the calling method. The calling method should give us the name of the actual function that called this. So let's grab this by running a new system.diagnostics.stacktrace. And then we're going to call two functions on top of that. We're going to do get frame and pass in the number two because we want the trace from two methods ago, I believe. We'll give you the correct one. Next, you can create a log message. And how we're gonna do that is we're going to create a string and we're gonna pass in our timestamp first. Then inside some square brackets, we can pass in our level. Uh, that will just come right from the string from the 
parameters of the function. Then the next thing we can do is we can pass in our calling method dot declaring type dot name. This should give us the actual class that called the method. And then we can just do the calling method dot name and that will give us the actual method inside that class. Finally, we can do a gd.print. You'll notice inside the gd.print, we pass in an array. First, we're gonna pass in the log message we created. This is going to be all of the prefix that each log will be prefixed with. And then the C sharp spread operator message. So any of you that have worked with JavaScript or TypeScript may recognize this as three dots. In C sharp, it's two. One of the reasons that we switched to .NET 8 or anything higher is so that we can use the spread operator. This won't be available to you in .NET 6 or below, I think. Go back to the Godot editor and inside of the core folder, create another script called globals.cs. This one, you can just use the default node template. And this file will be responsible for any global variables that we need to use inside of our project. You could add functions here or you could create a different class for functions, but the purpose of this is to access it from any script files that need to grab a variable that is shared across many different files. We're also going to run this as a singleton, which means that there's only, only going to be one instance of the globals class and Godot can create it for us. We don't actually have to create it ourselves. So create your namespace. Again, this is going to be game.core and copy your partial class globals into it. Now, the next thing you're going to do is you can just go ahead and erase the process in the comments. Create a public static globals instance, and we're gonna add a getter and a private setter. This will create our singleton. Inside the ready function, let's do a logger.info and then just say loading globals or whatever message you want. You'll see that logger is already available to us because it's in the same namespace. Let's add an export category here, this decorator and call it game variables. The reason that we do this is so inside of the editor, our variables will be divided into categories when it's running. It'll be really easy to read. We can export a public int uh, grid size and make that 16 because that's going to be our tile size. And finally, inside the ready function, you're going to want to make the instance equal to this. That way we actually initialize the singleton. So we create it with the static reference and then we initialize it this way. And again, Godot is going to be responsible for spinning this up. So how we do that is we're going to go back to the editor and we're going to go to our project and our project settings, go over to the globals tab, and then we're going to click the little folder inside of the path to grab our actual file. So that will be in your scripts core folder. And then you're going to give the node a name. Uh, it has to be the same name as the class. So we're just going to call it globals. So let's go ahead and create a scene to test out everything we have. Inside of this create root node, go ahead and click other node. I'm just gonna select the node class, the default class. I'm gonna call it game manager. And this is where our whole game is going to be sprouted from. And we're gonna save it inside of our scenes and create a subfolder called core inside of the scenes and just leave the game manager name the same and then save the game. And then what you can do is you can hit F6 and run the current scene. So let's see what happens. So once we start up the game, you'll see that there's nothing on the screen. That's because we don't actually have any game elements programmed yet. It's just basically just running the engine and the console for us. You'll see on the console below that we have a timestamp, a log level, the class and the function that the log call came from saying load and globals. This can be make this can make it very easy to trace the logging in your program, especially when your game gets very complicated. If you go over to the editor, you'll see that a remote and local tab have popped up. If you click remote, this is the actual objects that are running inside of your game right now. So you'll see it has the game manager that we created, but above it, you'll see the globals singleton class was created for us. So those will get instantiated before anything else in your game and your all of your uh, scenes will have access to it. And if you click on one of the nodes, you can see all of the stats show up for you on the right hand side in the inspector. Now let's fix this up a little bit more. Let's go ahead and create another class inside of our core folder and call it enums. And this is where all of our game enums can go to keep them organized. Inside of the file, we're going to go ahead and create our namespace. This will also be game.core. 
And inside of it, we're going to do a public enum log level. I like using capitals for my enums just to keep it simple, depending on what the enum is, I guess. We're going to add debug, info, warning, and error. And let's go over to our logger class and let's replace our string level with our log level. We're going to have to update our debug info warning and error functions to actually call the enum. Let's go ahead and do this now. So let's add some color to our logging to make it even a little bit more clear which one is which. So we're going to make our default color cyan. This will be for our info. And create a switch statement. And this will be our level. And each case will be each type of log level. So we'll have our log level debug, log level info, our log level. Oh, I think I spelled warning wrong. We can go ahead and fix that. So go back to the enum and fix that. And then we can go back and fix it here as well. And then once we fix that, add our log level error and our default, put a break statement at the bottom. Now, how you add color inside of Godot is like this. First, you can declare which color you want to use this way. So for debug, I'm going to use white. For info, I'm going to use uh, cyan. For warning, you can use something like yellow or orange. And then for error, obviously, people like to go with red. Now, once we get to our print statement, we can change this to print rich. And what this will do is allow us to put some, I believe it's called BB code into the actual printing to change the color or other settings. You can change like boldness and anything else you could normally do styling wise. How you're going to do this is add some tags and what it's going to be called is color. You're going to pass in the color variable and then a tag to close it off. And you could just put the log message inside of this tag, but leave the rest of the rest of the log message intact. That way you can see the log message clearly still against the gray background of the console, but you can see what type of logging level it is before you even read it. So let's add some extra log statements here to our game manager and let's go ahead and run the game just to see what they look like inside of the console. So you can see here the debug, everything up to the loading globals message is white. Everything is cyan for info. Everything is yellow for warning and uh, red for error. I don't like the way that red looks. You could use something like maroon. Maybe it'll look a little bit better. Let's save that and see if that's any better. And eh, that was not bad. I guess you could use either or. It doesn't really matter. But you guys get the point. That's how you add some color so you can see what's going on in your log messages. So let's go ahead and get rid of those logging messages and move on. The final thing we're going to add here in our prelim video is a game port or a sub viewport. What this will allow us to do is keep our game contained in a viewport and that way we can play with the resolution. Uh, for example, if you maximize the window, you might want to keep everything the same and not like zoom out from the actual game. You want to keep everything the exact same, just stretch it across your screen. And anything outside of that can still be controlled normally with whatever the normal resolution is of your monitor. So let's go ahead and add a new object to our game manager. And what we're going to add is a control node here. What we're going to do is select the preset for the full screen. And then once we do that, underneath the control, we're going to add another child node. And that child node is going to be a sub viewport container. And then one more child node underneath that is going to be our sub viewport. And this viewport has some options. You're going to notice on the inspector on the right side, and that's our size, our size 2D override and our override stretch. So if we open up our uh, project settings and we go to, uh, I believe it's general on the uh, run part, uh, you're going to notice the viewport width and height is 1152 by 648, or it is on my game anyways. And that's just the default window size. I'm just going to use that as the example to show you how to stretch the resolution. So what I do for the size and the 2D override, just make everything the same. And then make sure you select the override stretch on your sub viewport here. 
And just quickly to show you how this works, underneath the viewport here, we're gonna add a Sprite 2D. I'm just gonna add the icon that comes with all of the projects. We're gonna throw it in here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on our game just to make sure that it stretches properly. So let's just move it over a little bit so we can see it. That should be good enough. Go ahead and hit play from the current scene. And if I maximize the window, uh, oh, it doesn't stretch because we also have to add the stretch override to our sub viewport container. So go ahead and go to your sub viewport container and select the stretch option. Just go ahead and click that on. And now when you hit play, you can see when you maximize the screen, the game stretches for you so that everything stays the same size. With that, with our logging, our globals, our enums, everything in place, this video is finished. So the next video, we're gonna move on to actually creating a scene. And the video after that will be player movement so you can see yourself move around the level that you've just created. Okay guys, thank you so much for tuning back in and we'll see you in the next one.